So the Gulf Coast Prey LCC is a collaborative science support partnership working to deliver cultural and cultural resource conservation in the Gulf Coast Prairie geography by sharing scientific knowledge, leveraging resources, and working toward common landscape goals. The LCC chose 28 focal species that represent 17 broadly defined habitats in order to define and design long-term landscape conservation to achieve the mission of our partnership. In, in August of 2014, our steering committee approved our LCC science strategy that identifies the most critical science needs for six of these 28 species. One of these top tier focal species is American oyster, which is a, as, as we all know, a very uh, economically and culturally important species in the Gulf of Mexico. And it was chosen to represent uh, tidal wetlands and open bay systems. Today, we're joined by Dr. George Guilin and Dr. Mark Mockerich from the University of Houston at Clear Lake. And in just a moment, they'll give us an update on a multi-year project that seeks one, to identify and map selected shallow and intertidal oyster reefs and shell bottoms at selected sites along the Texas uh, coastal zone using a combination of technologies including drones and side scanning sonars. And two, to, to develop a consistent protocol for mapping and classifying those systems using those technologies. But before they take the floor, I'm, I would like to briefly introduce them. Dr. George Guilin is the Executive Director of the Environmental Institute of Houston and Associate Professor of Biology and Environmental Science at the University of Houston at Clear Lake. Dr. Guilin's research interests include evaluation of the impacts of pollutants, altered hydrology, and habitat modification on fish and wildlife populations, with a focus on estuarine systems. As the Executive Director of the Environmental Institute of Houston, he works to address regional issues of environmental concern by advancing understanding of the environment through interdisciplinary research, education, and outreach. Now, Dr. Mark Makarech is a research scientist and GIS analyst at the University of Houston and Clear Lakes Environmental Institute of Houston. Dr. Makarech's research is mainly focused on geospatial modeling, considering an interdisciplinary approach for analyzing and understanding future environmental and socioeconomic implications due to climate change and variability, especially in coastal areas with emphasis on sea level rise. So before we get into the presentation, I have a very quick poll for all of you in the audience on the line today to give us a sense of who we have, uh, give us a sense of who the audience is. So I'm going to go ahead and start this first poll. So if you would, uh, please designate um, yourself by profession and select the one response that best describes uh, how you spend most of your time at work. And this information is helpful for the presenters and myself to know kind of what the group uh, today looks like. So to take, just take a, a little bit of time. We've got some responses coming in, which is great. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close it. And so you can get a sense that uh, most of the folks on the line, by half of the folks who responded, consider themselves to be conservation planners or wildlife managers, uh, interesting um, uh, fisheries and, and aquatic managers and research scientists. So thank you all for, for providing that information. Uh, so, without further ado, Dr. Guilin and Makarech, we welcome you both. You have control of the webinar and the floor is yours. And I have you muted, so just one second. Okay, you go, try again. Thank you, Benjamin, and I uh, appreciate you setting this up for us to present our, our data and findings. And also, again, I'd like to uh, thank the Gulf Coast Prairie LCC for funding this project. 
And um, I'll go ahead and, and get started. Um, again, this project was focused on using new technology to, uh, or application new technology to map and uh, the extent of intertidal reefs. Uh, what I'm going, to, what we're going to do is give you a little bit of background for why we were interested in this project. Uh, a very quick listing of our primary project objectives, our study sites, including candidate sites, and what we actually, in the end, selected. Uh, then we'll go over uh, the actual use of, of UAV technology, and then the side scan sonar. Uh, work that we did, and then also uh, some background on the field sampling uh, for ground truthing, and then we'll finish up uh, talking about the implications of our work and some things that we found and some opportunities for future research and applications to management. As most of you know, uh, oyster reefs are a very important part of the estuarine ecosystem, probably more so than a lot of other uh, components because they uh, fulfill various functions and provide various services in addition to providing food for humans. Uh, they, and in particular, uh, they do things like improve water quality, they uh, you know, provide some protection against storm surge, of course they provide habitat for fish and wildlife, but intertidal reefs particularly provide some unique services and that includes uh, potential refugia from pathogens and predators in the intertidal zone, such as oyster drills and, to some extent, uh, dermo, uh, based on some uh, limited work. Uh, it also provides very important foraging habitat for various wading birds, and of course it does provide, uh, through hydrological modification, shoreline protection in adjacent areas such as salt marshes and also seagrass beds. Uh, as with many locations around the Gulf and, and into the Atlantic, uh, our area, in particular the upper Texas coast and middle coast, has uh, seen very dramatic declines in oyster reefs and associated shell island habitat. Uh, a lot of that was due to the advent of shell dredging uh, and that industry that lasted throughout most of the 1900s but was particularly severe during World War II and beyond. Uh, for two reasons. One, the shell was harvested uh, for um, a feedstock in the chemical industry that's located and centered here in Texas City area of Galveston Bay. And also to provide road baits. There's a long history along the Gulf Coast of shell roads that were constructed from oyster shells. And of course, other factors that have played into this is over harvest as well as damage from storms. And of course, we know that there's some future threats on the horizon that we're concerned with and how oysters may respond to that as both a resource as well as a habitat, that is particularly the effects of climate change. And so there's a need for development of a reliable assessment method and technique for mapping and determining the extent of intertidal reefs. So our key project objectives are listed here, and again, we wanted to uh, focus on these, these two here, uh, and that is the evaluation and use of UAV technology, as well as the evaluation and use of low-cost side scan sonar for collecting of imagery and mapping of intertidal oyster reefs in, in adjacent habitats. Uh, this is a map of Galveston Bay uh, that uh, was produced by the by Hart, the institute uh, located here in, in the Galveston Bay system. It's based on data provided from the 1950s and 1990s. And what I'm showing here is that most of these reefs are subtidal. Uh, there used to be an extensive amount of, uh, of reefs located in the uh, middle part of Galveston Bay that were destroyed through shell dredging and channelization. And so most of this area here, up into Trinity Bay, and all this area down here is more or less subtidal. The only appreciable uh, and significant amount of, of intertidal reefs that still exist in the Galveston Bay area is this Confederate Reef area that's located uh, in West Bay. Uh, 
And uh, this area here is Chronicle of uh, Reef. Most of the time, this is subtitle. Uh, and also another area located in Bastrop Bay. And so these were our two candidate sites that we were looking at initially for conducting this research. However, uh, reality hit us, and one of those realities is the fact that uh, the FAA, which regulates the use of drones for commercial purposes and for uh, research as well, uh, under existing rules as a designated no-fly areas. And if you will look uh, at this area uh, located over Galveston Island, that encompasses a large uh, percentage of the uh, Confederate reef area. And so uh, uh, we did look at talking with the tower, and based on newer regulations, uh, there was just no way we were going to be able to get permission to fly this area. We haven't given up, but not within this particular project time period are we going to be able to accomplish that. So we focused our areas instead in the Bastrop Bay area. Now, Bastrop Bay is a, a unique bay system. It's a secondary bay system here in Galveston. Uh, and it is um, located on the western edge of the Galveston Bay system. It is about 3,400 acres in area. The salinities range here uh, considerably from uh, a minimum recorded level of one part per thousand all the way up to very high salinities or around 35 parts per thousand. However, most of the time it usually ranges around 20 to uh, uh, lower 30s. And uh, the average depths here are very shallow, less than two feet. And in terms of commercial harvesting of oysters, uh, the area has been more or less closed since the uh, early 1970s. And the area was closed primarily due to high bacteria contents by, uh, by our state Department of Health, which uh, regulates the harvest of oysters uh, in terms of uh, you know, bacteria levels and so forth. And so it wasn't for any type of conservation measure, but more so to protect uh, human health. And so they have authority within our state to do so. Um, so again, we ultimately selected uh, Bastrop Bay uh, due to the presence of historical reefs, both shallow and intertidal. However, this area has been very difficult to survey, as, and most of the information, and this is just a, for your information, a, uh, a very nice fishing map. That slide has information on where you can catch redfish and things like that. But uh, it is uh, uh, probably good most to know that most of this is uh, was this information there that shows these simple areas as potential reef areas are based on informal surveys by fishermen and some old historical surveys. The last of them being in 1995, which was done physically at an interval of about three or four miles in distance. And uh, this was done by Powell in 1997, and these are black areas or areas that he believed there were some shell or oysters in Bastrop Bay. Uh, this just gives you an idea. These are some photos showing what the habitat looks like. Again, there's numerous series of long bars that uh, are found of exposed reef and shell islands and adjacent uh, uh, marshes. They're located in this particular bay system. It is relatively remote from most uh, fishermen. You have some kayakers uh, as well as uh, uh, just normal anglers that visit this area. It's not somewhere you can get to by walking out to unless you have a boat. So it is remote. And since it's not being commercially uh, uh, harvested by now, it makes for a very uh, unique and ideal experimental setting. Uh, Based on, again, the multiple criteria that we mentioned, including uh, FAA exclusion zones and the known presence of intertidal reefs, we selected two candidate sites to uh, try out and uh, utilize our methodology. Uh, these areas were also selected based on other criteria, namely uh, having an adjacent area where we can land the uh, UAV safely, and we tried to do that on places like marsh grass or uh, grassy fields where we don't have to worry about too much of a hard landing. 
and also having a clear line of sight per requirements by FAA when you operate these. And so we needed to have somewhere we could operate, uh, have a crew on a boat or on an island so we could see it while we're uh, navigating through the air for the uh, study site. And with that, I'm going to turn over the uh, presentation to, to Mark, and he will give you more information on the details of the instrumentation. Uh, we acquired the Quest Aqua version, which is a fixed wing UAV, in order to conduct the survey. Uh, having said that, always we operated uh, on the fact that uh, the uh, unit might not be 100% waterproof. We consider it as water resistant unit. Uh, these, these are some of the characteristics or specs of the, uh, of the UAV. Uh, the wingspan is around 7 feet. The weight is uh, up to 13 pounds. That includes the battery, three uh, battery and two uh, cameras. It's heavy bed. This is why it requires minimum speed in order to operate uh, 27 to uh, 56 miles per hour. It can operate for a time span of up to 45 minutes. Uh, just to mention that this is a photogrammetric uh, uh, UAV, which means it, uh, it can operate in order to uh, create, establish uh, uh, telescopic viewing of the site we are surveying. If we move to the next slide, you will see this is maybe some of the audience is uh, interested in knowing how the, the unit is protected from water, which is quite important because you know, we are operating in coastal areas. You can see here that most of the parts, especially the electronics, are uh, uh, located within steel boxes. These boxes have some uh, uh, breathers, we call them, to allow the ventilation and the heat to go out. And you can see here, for example, the flight, uh, flight data uh, recorder, the antenna, autopilot, the autopilot, which is the most important part of the UAV, is built in its own box. We have the cameras as well, protected, the parachute compartment, and here we have the uh, battery compartment. What's exposed in this unit is the, um, mainly the motor uh, and the electronic seat controller, which is located in the cockpit in, in this area. Uh, there are some legal aspects you need to be aware of, and uh, it took really a while in order to get our exemption, which is the old way of uh, um, being le legal. So we got the 333 exemption uh, in February 10, 2016, to operate uh, with a blanket of uh, up to 200 feet. After that, we raised it immediately, I think, in, in a month's time, if I recall it. To 400 feet. Uh, the UAV is registered as an aircraft. It has numbers should be visible on it. Uh, plus, it has to be insured. It has to have comprehensive insurance. Now, the main step we followed in order to um, accomplish uh, the task to start with the planning. Uh, the site planning can be done. Can start from the office using, for example, Google Earth to uh, analyze where, where you, you have potential sites. And there is really it, it, an important need to visit the site itself before you conduct the plan. Acquiring the permissions, if you need waivers of any, any type, you need to understand as well the uh, weather conditions, so the wind speed and the limits uh, of your UAV. So you have to combine these uh, two. Also, you have to prepare the crew so our crew, uh, in this case, uh, consists of four people. We are talking about the pilot, who is in control uh, of the UAV, commander, who is uh, control of the UAV on the computer. Uh, and we have two important uh, observers who are really there in order to monitor what's going on in the airspace and on the ground and to alert the crew uh, if anything is changing for example, if there is an aircraft approaching or anything where the pilot can, um, um, you know, 
consider that and bring the aircraft back home. Uh, you need to understand as well here as well that you need a plan in advance, uh, which means you need to decide uh, at which altitude you need to fly. Uh, and of course, this will have an implication on the spatial resolution of the images. And you need to make sure that the takeoff area uh, or size and landing are available nearby. Timing is important. What time you need to arrive in order to uh, be uh, able really to launch it, your aircraft on time and uh, complete the task. Uh, you need to understand as well uh, what's going on nearby, especially if there is any uh, notion, uh, any you know, airspace, airspace activity nearby. So all that we took into account in, in our planning. And we developed, developed uh, a plan uh, to, uh, to decide which airport, uh, which boat to take with the uh, with us in order to reach the site. For example, an airboat is uh, quite important when we talk about shallow water. So uh, for navigation, easy navigation, we recommend uh, something like that. Uh, UAV readiness as well. There are a long list of checklists um, at the base. Uh, and three flights, two hours before flight. Uh, and three takeoff. All these checklists, you know, we went through them in each flight we conducted. We set up the launch line, uh, as you will see in the examples coming in the video, uh, tripod and bungee, and we apply tension and we launch the uh, aircraft up in the sky. Once uh, the aircraft is back, we uh, try to check the data and download the data, uh, and that will include um, raw images as well as the waypoints and the orientation of the images. And after that, office processing using the uh, big 4D platform. So here, uh, just to mention that uh, we um, flew at different altitudes, uh, at 400 feet, 300 feet, and 200 feet. The lower the altitude, the lower the altitude, the better spatial resolution of the image you will get. For example, you can see that the 200 feet uh, produce 2.2 centimeters spatial resolution. The only problem, if you go lower than that, the response of the pilot will be quite limited. Uh, the pilot always needs uh, some time in order to react to any emergency case uh, and launch the chute, for example, if it's needed. Uh, and we don't recommend, for example, lower than 100 feet in this case. Uh, we have two videos here to show you, to share with you, launching the UAV and landing the UAV, and I hope they are good. I'll start the launch. And this is the landing video. You can see where I'm circling the cursor. The aircraft is approaching to land. Uh, I thought to show you uh, a typical plan that we use, this is the first plan we flew. You can see here that the launching took place uh, in this area, here where ERT is located, the red triangle. And the aircraft was launched southeast towards the wind. And you can see here it went up, lined up to 300 feet, and after that uh, entered what we call a grid. We design it. And you can see within that grid, we have an overlap or overlap images. Uh, we have overlap images and side lab images. In 
all the to guarantee that there are no gaps in the final product. So the uh, aircraft entered the grid and flew line by line till it covered completely, and after that it went back and down, circled clockwise, and after that to land in, in the, uh, where it's supposed to land. So this is the first plan we flew. And we went back and we processed the data. This is the point cloud that you can reduce in this 4D. And you can recognize these are the images. The uh, blue and green uh, images that indicate that these images can be corrected and rotted, while the red ones uh, are ha have some issues, so they cannot be processed. We did some investigation in order to understand what's going on, and we discovered that uh, you need um, enough three points on each image in order to allow the system to process the data. So what we did, actually, we went back and we revised our plan. You can see here it's a completely different plan. Uh, plan, And uh, you can see that uh, our plan is to fly along the reef. This is a linear uh, reef. It's the same thing. You fly um, towards the wind. And in this case, it was towards the wind to the west, uh, point one. And after that, fly down all the way to the end of the reef, and after that, enter the first line and survey the reef, come back and survey the second line, and then go back, circle, and land. And the results really were impressive. You can see here most of the images we collected were uh, processed, except these two. And I think, I think these, it, it was because of uh, a drift. I think the aircraft was drifted slightly, and these images didn't enough uh, didn't have enough three points to be processed. This is the final uh, result, and also image which you can uh, uh, you can do some measurements on on, on it because it has uh, a uniform uh, scale. If I move on, uh, this is a closer look at the reef, uh, which we flew at 200 feet, which is 2.2 centimeter spatial resolution. And you can, in, in the GIS environment, you can zoom further, and you will be able to really detect the detail to the level that you can see the, 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 uh, some of the oysters on, on the uh, surface of the reef. We started investigating the processing, the digital image processing of the data in order to understand if we can develop a unique signature for each category in our data set. You can recognize from this graph, this scatter plot between the green band and the red band in our data. You can recognize the uh, shallow water and deep water. They are quite distinct. It's well known that you know, water absorbs energy. Uh, which means uh, we ended up here with all the uh, other categories, including oyster, that include life, and dead oyster. And it was um, quite challenging in order to separate the life from uh, uh, dead oysters digitally. This is why we uh, applied the uh, ISO clustering unsupervised classification, uh, which is an, an, uh, an iterative optimization clustering procedure uh, where the system itself identifies groups or clusters automatically based on the distorted digital value in the data set. Uh, here in this case, uh, and for those who are not familiar with unsupervised classification, you don't need to um, um, uh, provide training data for this type of classification. The only thing that the um, analyst needs to do is to identify the number of classes you want to obtain from it. And uh, in order to reach this representation or this product, we started with large number of uh, classes. And after that, we narrowed down, down to uh, these, four, these five categories, water, submerged, wet reef, uh, exposed reef one, exposed reef two. This is uh, another. The size two uh, we mentioned, 
this is 3D uh, representation. I will go to slide here, I think, for a minute, just to, uh, for a minute, just to uh, explain what we are looking at. So here uh, I'm moving to a GIS environment in order to visualize the slide. We conducted the slide on the second side. As you can see here, if I zoom in slightly, uh, we launched from this area and the aircraft lined up. So you can see the blue line here, a path the flight took in order to reach the uh, 200 uh, feet altitude. And after that, uh, it navigated to uh, the grid we have here and started surveying the site line by line. Now the shape of that grid here is different from the one before. So in this case, we used the grid and it worked well. And after that, once the grid has been surveyed, the uh, aircraft has been controlled and uh, uh, navigated. You can see here, for example, uh, rotation, and uh, after that, it, it came back home to land. However, during the last few couple of minutes during the flight, uh, and usually I, I, I mention this because, uh, okay, the, the flight was successful, but at the end of, of that flight, um, because of the wind, the flight uh, went off course, and the pilot needed to intervene and bring, try to bring the aircraft back home, but ended up nearby in the water. And this is the beauty of having uh, waterproof uh, aircraft. Um, we uh, just retrieved the aircraft and uh, everything was fine. So I'll go, I'll go back to my slide. This is tied to uh, the final product. We can see here after creating the auto uh, image of the flight. Again, we reached to the same. Uh, we uh, reached the same spatial resolution, 2.2, the same as the flight one. If we look further, you would recognize you would recognize the level of detail here, and we use that. Um, for example, you can see here uh, that you can distinguish where at the oyster reef where you have quite tough surface from the area where it still submerged. And you can see here the color as well is slightly different. Uh, here you have here kind of beige color. It's uh, an indication that you have mud combined with uh, oyster. So we did the same algorithm. We run the same algorithm, the isoclustering uh, unsupervised classification, and this was Hello, um, this is Greg, one of the people helping to run this webinar. I just wondered if you could speak up a little bit more or get closer to your computer microphone because the, the volume went down and we're having a hard time hearing. Okay. So this is uh, just to show you the uh, comparison between the uh, visible image and the classified image and you can recognize the, uh, how distinct the reef and the oysters are identified from the uh, visible image. Now I'll, I'll mention the main uh, steps for conducting the site scan. Uh, planning is important as well. Usually we use um, Google Earth. Uh, we uh, try to understand as well the weather conditions, especially in regards to water level. We need enough water level in order to be able to navigate and collect the site scan uh, images. Uh, and we have planned exactly uh, which area we need to visit and how many lines we need to conduct in order to collect the data. Uh, installed the site scanning system on a board must be done carefully. Uh, you need to you use the right uh, board. For example, in this case, we use the simple uh, console, uh, well craft, and we use Air Force as well. We tried Air Force, and we use Kayak as well. After that, the next step to conduct the survey, back to the office, download the data, and the data includes uh, both raw images and waypoints, and we collected recordings as well, videos, 
can also be used in the uh, final processing. Uh, we use different uh, platforms for processing, digital image processing, Sonar PRX, which allows us to process quickly the video recording uh, we collected. And we use as well ArcGIS uh, extension in order to uh, process the individual snapshots we collected in our camera. This is just to show you how the system was set up. As you can see here, uh, you, in front, you can see that uh, the uh, uh, transducer was mounted in front of the post in order to reduce the amount of distortion as the post moves. This is another example of uh, examining the system and collecting data using a, a side scan sonar Hammerberg 1197 installed on the kayak. And this is an example of um, a, a process image. You can see here we are talking about an image for a reach of uh, 830 meters with a width of 30 meters. The total area of the reach is around 2.5 hectares. This is closer look, and I don't know, I hope you are uh, seeing the image clearly. You can distinguish uh, the edge of uh, the reef. And this can be used, uh, can be used uh, and, uh, in order to uh, outline the reef properly. This is another example of collecting side scanning uh, sonar data in, on, uh, in the second slide. I'm just showing two lines. There are multiple lines covering all, the whole area. And you can see here that the system is uh, capable of distinguishing where you have patches of uh, reef with oyster and where you have, for example, a uh, much smaller area on site. Okay. I'll, I'll turn it to George now. As Dr. Mark Resch has indicated, um, you know, you can run, use the, some of this imagery in an unclassified mode to uh, try to determine different areas, whether you have shell or hard bottom, uh, live and dead oyster reef. But we also wanted to uh, attempt to do some training and, and field validation where we would go out and we had previously surveyed uh, both of these areas as well as other candidate sites. And so we knew where the, the reefs were and had done that type of sampling. But we also wanted to do some detailed ground truthing. And so uh, we went out, uh, just for example, this one site here, and we collected some uh, 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 points within the reef uh, system. And uh, 15 of those were used for training and 20 were used for validation. And this consisted of going out and taking a one by one meter quadrat for compositional sampling. And that meant that we looked at the percentage of live oyster, dead oyster, shell hash, and non-shell hash, i.e. mud. In addition, we wanted to collect information on the presence of other types of organisms, just mainly to assess uh, the reef health, the presence of oyster drills, uh, uh, boring sponges, as well as other fouling organisms that typically grow on, on reefs. And these are the uh, randomly distributed uh, sampling sites. We have 35 sites we visited uh, on site. Uh, we took, uh, we combined all the data we collected. That includes the sonar images uh, and the auto uh, images we, we, we have. Uh, plus the uh, supervised, uh, the unsupervised classified images with the samples we collected and we combined all the information uh, and we uh, did visual interpretation using texture and color and tone in order to delineate the different areas of, on the site with different composition. And what you are looking at here is just an example showing the distribution of the live oysters uh, in uh, five, or I'll say six different classes. First class where you don't have live oyster, while the second, for example, anything between zero and 20, uh, 
the, the sales between 20 and 40 and so on and so forth. The total area we, um, um, we surveyed was uh, 7.3 hectares. Finally, we, we, uh, these are just you know, some remarks and com uh, conclusions. Um, um, number one, for example, marriage shallow water treats using UAV is a promising approach. We are really happy with the results we uh, collected, um, although you have seen only samples, especially in regards to the UAV. Uh, the, the, the results are really superior when you compare them to the uh, sonar images. Sonar images as well can be useful to fill in gaps and uh, help us to delineate properly uh, the, uh, the, the shallow region in order to uh, understand exactly the spatial distribution of them. Acquiring UAV, uh, UAV mapping capability wasn't something really simple. The legal issues are, um, they were changing during the period where, uh, you know, the requirements for operating UAV were changing over the this period. Hopefully now they are stabilized by the new, uh, by having the new rule. The new rule just to mention here is uh, that in order to operate more UAV, you need to be a UAV uh, pilot, uh, pilot certified by the FAA, which means the person needs to have a test, take a test, and after that you need to do the, the training on your own, or maybe maybe uh, factory training. Uh, now, acquiring permissions to fly in no-fly zones, and here no-fly zones, I'm talking about UAV, no, UAV no-fly zones, is not an easy uh, process. It requires uh, to file a form to the FAA, and uh, you have to mention in advance when exactly you want to fly, what time, and uh, really, uh, under the condition to operate it, it was really hard to provide that uh, because um, one of the criteria um, is that when we have low water, when we have cold front coming in, uh, and it, it, it was really hard to answer that question. Plus, you don't hear back from the FAA. Um, they have you know, 90 days to respond to your request in order to allow you to fly in within these. Uh, UAV-based uh, mapping can be challenging in coastal areas. You saw I show you the uh, incident uh, in terms of landing in water. It could happen, and it will happen, no doubt about that. Navigation is uh, another issue. You need to make sure that the boat really you are using is capable of bringing you to that site you are selecting. Launching and landing sites need to be nearby so you can avoid it. Other items you need to pay attention include uh, the weather conditions. You need to have really full understanding of the weather conditions, the shape of the water body you are operating in, for example, the bay, uh, and how the bay is responding during the uh, tidal uh, you know, change, by the, um, uh, the outlet of, of uh, where the water can be drained. So all that combined with the weather conditions need to be understood properly. And the shape of the reef, as uh, I, I, I showed in the example, you have to be careful uh, how you develop the plan. I'll, I'll pass it now to George to talk about what's next. Well, one of the uh, things that we're hoping to do in the near future is to survey larger areas. And uh, of course, this will require the use of more than one pilot because of the re regulations requiring line of sight. So uh, we're in the process, in fact, we just had another individual uh, that went through the training and, and, and gotten uh, certified to operate this, and, and so that will extend our capability. And we're also looking at higher resolution cameras. Even though we had very detailed photography and, and imagery, we like to improve on that, and there's now new generations of cameras that can give you even higher resolution. Um, also, we're, we're looking at uh, also trying to acquire uh, a copter, which will allow us to survey smaller areas in a lot more detail. In other words, allow us to hover and stay in one location. 
they, the drone that we have is very nice and you can survey large areas, but of course if you want to focus in on a particular area, that's where it's, 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 it's weak. And obviously if you want to map larger areas, you have to fly at a higher altitude, which sacrifices some uh, resolution the higher you go up. And so we think the combination of both of those will help kind of meet all the requirements we would we want to in terms of any type of mapping for purposes like this. Uh, one of the things that uh, we ran into in terms of Christmas Bay is that in, in, in uh, Bastrop Bay, it is isolated. And as Dr. Mokresh noted, uh, Texas Bays and, of course, most of the estuaries here along the Gulf Coast are the tides and the water levels are driven more by meteorological events and the geomorphology of individual secondary bays. And so it's very hard to predict some, uh, often when a, you know, what water level you're going to encounter in, in some of these back bays, and especially if all you have is a, uh, a gauge that's located, you know, five miles away in, a, in one of the larger bay systems. So in the future, we're going to try to, uh, one, install a recording tide gauge that's been calibrated against, uh, you know, a known uh, datum. Uh, for two reasons, one, to document that and also to uh, try to develop a, a, a model that would predict the amount of intertidal reef exposed at various tide levels so that we could actually do some animation and do some what if the tide levels went higher or went lower or whatever, uh, kind of trying to get at the uh, uh, climate change scenarios. Um, the other thing we want to do is because oysters, of course, are sensitive to uh, salinity in regards to some of their uh, uh, predators and um, parasites uh, to install some recording salinity gauges at the same sites uh, to, to uh, model uh, potential uh, you know mortality and uh, events associated with uh, fresh water fresh water inflow or drought period uh, and one of the things that we're wanting to do is compare there's been lots of theories as to you know how important uh, these intertidal reefs are in terms of providing population refugia and uh, from from parasites and, and uh, uh, predators is to do some actual monitoring of intertidal reefs, looking at both density, size of oysters, growth history, and the presence and intensity of perpenses. We have uh, uh, some. We've been doing some work with um, Dermo in our lab here, and. If Hopefully, and the, the end product would be some type of, of oyster population model for uh, intertidal reefs, trying to predict viability and density uh, over various time periods. And so, uh, that's kind of our, you know, dream in the future of things we'd like to do, and things. Some of this we can we're working on now. Some of it will depend on, you know, of course, long-term funding and things like that. But with that. Uh, we're finished and uh, we're open for questions now. You're Dr. Makresh or myself. Well, great. Thank you both for presenting a very detailed overview. Um, really appreciate the, uh, the videos and the animations. Um, give us a sense of the work that you did on the ground. I'm going to go ahead and um, open up the, um, the discussion here in just one second. Before I do, I just want to do another quick uh, poll for the audience. It's essentially based on what you saw and heard today, in what format would you prefer to get the results from this project? Now, thinking about the utility of the information and, and how you might uh, work with that information in your day to day. So, while you answer that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, make sure you all can. Have access to open discussion. So if you have a question for the line, uh, you can raise your hand or you can uh, type a question in the chat box. Hey, Ben, we do have a question from Yvonne. OK. And also I'll try and unmute her. OK, you there, Yvonne, you you're, you're live. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. 
Uh, great. Yeah. Um, I, I, my question was that have you done uh, a comparison between this is obviously, you know, you're trying to do this to offer a better technology over what's existing. So have you done a comparison of the UAV, just specifically the aerial or the uh, subtitle stuff or the uh, intertidal stuff? Have you done a comparison between the UAV and other more easily available stuff like uh, aerial photography or high resolution satellite imagery? Um, bearing in mind that, that those data have to be captured when you have some, you know, favorable meteorological and tidal conditions. Have you done that comparison? Hello? If someone is answering, we can't hear it at all. Yeah, if you, if, if, if you get closer to the phone, that'd be, that'd be helpful. Okay, uh, try again. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. Uh, what we uh, were aiming here is to reach very high resolution that cannot be provided by satellite imagery. This is why uh, we, we hope that we can make such kind of comparison, but um, um, for, for this project, actually, we haven't done this type of, pro, uh, of comparison because of the lack of satellite imagery at the exact time that we need to make that type of comparison. At the exact time, I'm talking about when we have the reef exposed and we, uh, that they can be uh, captured in the image. Yeah, just to give you uh, some additional background on that, we specifically flew these uh, missions uh, most of the time uh, immediately after, and I, when I say immediately, usually a day after a very strong cold front so we get maximum exposure. And, you know, we're comparing that with normal conditions or, you know, rel relatively normal or uh, moderate tides. And so, again, matching those up in terms of the satellite imagery would be very difficult. Not impossible, but um, um, certainly it would be difficult. And in terms of the detailed uh, and, uh, and also potentially expensive, but the detailed uh, 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 that you get from a set, and I'll leave this to Dr. Mockridge, but as I understand today, the the, the detail and uh, is just not there in terms of satellite imagery compared to aerial imagery. We, we, we actually are next door neighbors with NASA and went and visited with their folks over there to talk to them about sat comparing satellite versus aerial imagery. And, and we told them what we were trying to achieve. And they said, we don't know of anything that can get down to that kind of detail right now. Um, and it certainly is something that could be looked forward later on. As far as airplane imagery, yeah, certainly you can use aerial uh, flights with airplane, but again, you'd have to basically get very high resolution cameras, have them fly very low, and go out under those conditions. And uh, whether that's cheaper or more expensive, you know, you would have to look at those, uh, uh, certainly. There is, there is a question from William Rodney. I will read it. Do you uh, pre-program survey lines into UAV? Yes, the plan uh, you, I showed you is uh, a pre-prepared plan in the office. Usually what we do actually, we decide exactly at which altitude we want to fly, which area we need to cover, how many lines, the overlap and the side lab. And after that, we go to uh, the field and we make our final adjustment in the field based on the change in wind direction. So I hope I address the question. Would you like to me to unmute William Rodney? William, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Thanks for answering my question. So I guess there's some proprietary software that comes with the UAV or, or the camera that, that you do that with. 
There's, is there, there, I guess there's some kind of a proprietary software that comes with your UAV to do that with? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, there is, there is software that comes with the autopilot that is integrated into the UAV that allow us to develop a plan and after that to adjust it in the pitch. Thank you. Okay, I have a question for you all. I know there's, um, you, you pointed out there's some, some substantial hurdles in, in getting an operation like this off the ground and um, from the administrative burden of, of getting a license or getting permission from the FAA and acquiring the technology, getting used to it. But can you, can you give us maybe, uh, you know, what are some suggestions on what do you do first, what do you do second? and uh, how long it might take to get up to speed on uh, applying this type of uh, technique somewhere else? Uh, okay, I mean, I mean, first of all, uh, you need to, uh, to, to have the funds, of course, in order to decide which UAV uh, you want to purchase. And of course, the funds should be, um, I mean, they are the UAV, you know, systems now, are developing so fast and new capabilities are coming really uh, by the day. This is why you need to pick the exact capabilities that you need for your project. For example, for something like that, you need a photogrammetry system integrated in, uh, in the UAV. Uh, and uh, once you decide that, of course, you are operating in coastal areas. My advice is make sure that at least your UAV is water resistant. Uh, you, you acquire the funds, and after that, you move to the legal issues. Uh, I think these days, after the, the, the rule has been revised and finalized, I think uh, maybe it will take maybe a couple of months in order to get a uh, certificate to be a pilot so you can operate the UAV. Uh, then the training, practicing, in order to control the UAV up in the air to be able to uh, fly it, uh, launch it, and land it. Uh, I think this will uh, require some, uh, some time. Uh, it takes time, really. My advice in this regard is to uh, attend the factory training. Uh, I think this is what we did. Uh, it was quite valuable for us. Once you do that, uh, of course, you uh, you start implementing what you have learned and try to collect uh, the data um, you you need for your project. Now, one of the, one of the benefits we had was that, and I, I wanted I just wanted to also uh, uh, acknowledge his contribution is uh, James Yokely, who's our uh, research associate here, is also our pilot. Well, he was already a uh, an airplane pilot, and so he was very familiar with a lot of the FAA regulations, and that helped tremendously. Uh, but like anything, uh, whether you're learning to drive a new boat or a new car or whatever, uh, again, practice is very important if you have an area where you can safely land it and or crash it <laughs> without hurting anybody or anything. Uh, that's very important before you actually go out and start using it. And, it, and you know, uh, that's not just me saying that. You, you know, we, we know consultants and folks who have their own UAV systems, and every one of them is unique in terms of the feel and operation and, you know, the bells and whistles. And, uh, and certainly, there, as Dr. Mockresh has noted, they've, uh, there's a lot more choices now. There's also... Uh, low-end models, depending on what you're wanting to do, if you just want to take photographs versus do some very detailed surveying, which requires, you know, information on height and bandwidth and all that kind of stuff, you know, you can get by with a lot less. And it just depends on what kind of information you're wanting to collect. And, of course, things are coming down on price in many ways, but also at the upper end they're going up because there's more and more features being added in terms of capability, programmability, where you know automated, like you were just describing, and so um, it's a tough thing to 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 uh, uh, to answer. But I'll just give you a, a, an idea. I, you know, I have a, a graduate student that works for a consulting firm, and they use UAVs extensively. 
mainly for surveying uh, uh, project sites, and they have some units that are less than two thousand dollars. And you know, of course, you still need to get your uh, FAA license, but you know, are relatively simple to operate. But they're using it for very simple purposes. And so, uh, I, hopefully, I can provide you some kind of range of conditions that you might expect. Great, thank you. All that all that information is very very helpful. So, uh, I think the video I think the video game uh, generation does quite well with this though. Sure. <laughs> is what I sure found. absolutely. <laughs> okay, well I know that it's the top of the hour. To be mindful of everyone's time, I appreciate uh, both you, George and Mark, for for providing an overview of the project. I note that uh, we're hoping to have the final report in hand um, reasonably soon, next couple of months. And based on the registration of everyone today, we'll, we'll send out a, a notice when uh, the final report and everything are posted so that uh, folks want to get a, take a deeper dive. Um, I also recommend that if you have any additional questions or comments, uh, get a hold of Dr. Makaresh or, or, or Dr. Guilin uh, there at the University of Houston Clear Lake. And uh, just as a last, uh, a last thing to say is that uh, uh, the, the LCC, we usually uh, do these uh, webinars uh, every month. We're going to take the next few months off. We'll start back up in August. So if you get our newsletters, then be on the lookout for uh, a well-packaged series for the fall. So um, thanks again for everyone's time. And uh, I hope you have a, a very uh, enjoyable day wherever you are. So thanks all. Thank you. Thank you.